democracy is saying I'm going to have my congregation cloned. That was a very terrific idea yeah. at one point, not long ago, right? <laughs> That's true. Now, this next one is sort of interesting. In our denomination, we have a position, uh, a lay position, called the lay leader. And, uh, of course, Stan Freeberg made famous the line, take me to your leader. I'm suggesting that perhaps uh, an, uh, an outer space person or alien acquainted with our structure might ask the minister to be taken to his lay leader. And there it is. All right, finally, this one coming up. When I was uh, beginning my uh, churches in the ministry, I had two churches that were about three miles apart. We had to drive between the churches from, con uh, from service to service. And uh, in the wintertime, it got a little bit uh, hairy, to say the least, to try to get from church to church. So I'm saying here, uh, it's mornings like this that uh, take the glamour out of... Uh, I'm sorry, that the glamour of circuit riding preaching pales into insignificance. Yeah, I can well imagine. And this year has been a, a year in which that would really take, there are recent snows and things, That's right? That's true. All right, here's another one. One of the common problems that ministers have in their churches is finding a qualified custodian. I think almost every minister has been through some custodian that uh, was pretty klutzy. And here we have one example. The minister saying to his parishioner, now you know why we dubbed our custodian the Duke of Hazards. Uh, I will not comment it. That's probably another network. Okay. <laughs> oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Of course not. All right. All right. Let's go on with the next. I've had some uh, experience in the church office before I had a secretary, and uh, typing stencils uh, requires having a little bottle of correction fluid there uh, to correct the mistakes that you make on the stencil. Uh, anyone who's worked with correction fluid knows that it's a pretty potent type of thing, and what I'm suggesting here is that too much of it could have adverse effects. The minister is admonishing his secretary here, Brenda, how many times have I told you to be careful with that correction fluid? Well, I'd like to point out to you, Carl, that I don't think that's probably the way that we should try to get to heaven. Uh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. That. Absolutely fluid. not. And this? This one I, I'm very uh, happy with. It was a, a cartoon that a friend of mine suggested, uh, another pastor up in Massachusetts named Scott Campbell. He gives me some ideas from time to time, and so I drew this one up, the huge truckload of grape juice that's being delivered to the church, and the minister trying to comfort his tearful secretary by saying, actually, Miss Jensen, it's my fault. When I asked you to order the supplies for worldwide communion, I should have explained that they weren't all coming here. <laughs> Maybe a personal computer would have helped, huh? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> now, Maybe. I think it'd be interesting for the audience just to have a, a look at, at how you go about doing a, a cartoon. Okay. And, and I just want to quickly look at this. Th these are some stages. This is the first stage is what? That's right. This uh, stage here, I'm trying to get the positioning of the main characters in the cartoon. Absolutely no detail or anything, just spacing out the characters in the whole panel sort of and getting my horizon line in a, shape. A stick drawing, in That's other right. Words. Very basic. Here we get some of the shapes uh, to the different characters, uh, cones and uh, so forth like that, beginning to round out the shapes and giving them some dimension and definition. And then we have uh, next stage. We outline the different shapes here, uh, give, giving them some identifiable forms now as a, a person and a fish. And finally? And finally, the inking in, and uh, what I would do here would be erase the pencil lines and so forth, giving some action lines, details, freckles on the boy's face, and so forth. How did you get started in this business of doing cartoons? I really began just by scribbling on the walls in my house. Uh, drew a train on the woodwork, and my father didn't like that, but my mother left it up. Uh, when I got into high school, I was drawing cartoons for our high school newspaper, The Criterion. And that carried over into my college years when I was an editorial cartoonist for the Orange and Black. And you got an award for that, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. I got a trophy. Well, didn't you ever get thinking that maybe you'd like to be a cartoonist as a professional? If I would go into cartooning, Dr. Barber, full-time, I'm afraid that there would be a lot of other things that as a minister I also need to do that I wouldn't have the opportunity to do if I were a full-time cartoonist. How do you use these cartoons? Did you, you pin them up in the church hall, or are they published in the local church gazette? What do you do with them? Well, uh, some of them are published in our Methodist publications. The United Methodist Relay will publish cartoons of mine from time to time. The uh, first cartoon that you displayed here was published in the Circuit Rider, which is a United Methodist journal mm -hmm. uh, distrib distributed nationally. Uh, yes, I do, from time to time, put them in our newsletters as well. What do you say to critics who suggest and I'm sure there are some who do, that a man of the cloth is doing something kind of frivolous when he, when he satirizes the religious life with cartoons. Well, I haven't really gotten that comment. Uh, most of the people see it uh, as something unique and uh, something that they, ha they believe has some value, I think. Have you ever thought about using the cartoon to suggest 
a religious position about more serious things than just parish life. For example, the church's or the religious community's position on such things as nuclear disarmament and uh, the Holocaust and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have given thought to that. Uh, the most current cartoon that was published uh, that I drew had to do with the criticism that the World Council and National Councils of Churches have received from Reader's Digest and um, a CBS program. <laughs> and, 60 minutes, you can thank say Thank you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in that, um, I, I portrayed the United Methodist Church as the sleeping giant, one mosquito as the Reader's Digest, and another mosquito as 60 minutes, and the sleeping giant poised and ready to swat at the mosquitoes. Do you think that cartoons uh, can be used to teach? I mean, you know there have been these cartoons out now on the life of St. Francis and, and subsequently on Pope John Paul II. That's right. Uh, I think that's a very valuable means of communication, and I should hope that this kind of uh, medium kind of communication would be more widely used, primarily because you can reach children better with something like this, I think. One last burning and sensitive question, Carl. Okay. When you get the Sunday paper, what do you read first, the news or the cartoons? Do you want my honest opinion? Sure. The cartoons. Thanks very much for coming to the first My pleasure. Thank it's you. a pleasure. <laughs> The National Conference of Christians and Jews was established in 1928 to resolve interreligious and interracial tensions in America. Last year, the conference elected Jacqueline Grennan Wexler as its new president, and she's here today with a progress report on how well Christians and Jews are getting along. Thanks very much for coming. We've tried to get you for a year, and you've been a very busy person. Uh, I've been working rather hard, but <laughs> well, we're, with we're delighted a lot of vitality. Mm -hmm. Delighted to have you here. Um, let me ask you the sort of basic questions. I, I, are Americans any less prejudiced now than they were in 1928 when your organization got started? Oh, yes. I think Americans are much less prejudiced uh, than they were in 1928. Uh, in 1928, I wasn't yet in parochial school in my little town in Illinois. Uh, but it's hard for me to, uh, to bring up to my memory the fact that a couple or three years later, when I was in first grade, I must have been mouthing those god-awful words, the perfidious Jews, on Good Friday, and so were all other little Catholic kids around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, um, you know, thank God that's almost impossible to remember at this point, and I think you can find example after example. Um, I, um, at the same time, couldn't swim in uh, the local YWCA uh, because the pastor, in all his good intents, didn't think we ought to be contaminated by being in a Protestant uh, building. Um, you know, when we go back that many years, 50, uh, 50 or a few more years, um, we do realize how far we've come. One of the reasons that we see how bad it is was we've surfaced it all. We didn't surface it then. What, what are the areas that are still a great concern to you? Where do we need to make work? Well, I continue to believe that the interreligious tensions are there in themselves. Um, they, are, they have been mollified a good bit, but they are there. And I think interreligious tensions are so often at the root of what appear to be intercultural tensions. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that fascinates and frustrates me is uh, the, the, uh, the tension between commitment and openness. Uh, how one can be committed to, reverential about one's roots, one's own way of life, and at the same time, be open and respectful of other choices. Um, it's a I, fine line. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a zone. It's never a line. It's a zone of tension. Uh, m we, we come out of a world, a very long established world that was hierarchical, and so often very good people knowingly or unknowingly, uh, base their dignity on the indignity of someone else. What is the, this is probably a crazy question, but what is the more serious kind of prejudice in your opinion, Mrs. Wexler? Is it interracial or interreligious? Oh, I suppose I would not pick either term. I would say it's inter, that it's intercultural uh, and that religion is a, is a deeply rooted part of cultures and race is a deeply rooted part of cultures. Uh, but in the end, it is uh, an intercultural set of tensions. How would you then characterize the, the National Conference of Christians and Jews? Is it a cultural organization? Is it a religious organization? Is it a social organization? It's a, it's a human relations organization. Uh, in the broadest sense, it's intercultural. It was founded to deal with the interreligious tensions um, that surfaced after the abortive Al Smith campaign. 
And interestingly enough, it, uh, it happened because a group of my fellow Roman Catholics at that time, for the first time, experienced what virulent prejudice is all about, what it feels like. And I'm utterly convinced that no one is in a position to be sympathetic, much less empathetic, to another's pain until he or she has felt that kind of pain. The Jewish people had felt it for centuries. They'd known it almost all of their individual lives, and they had known it more in their genealogical lives. Would you say that the political scene is an accurate barometer of how prejudice is changing? I'm thinking back to the fact that there was a time when, and it was unthinkable that we'd have a Catholic president, and then one of the most revered presidents we have, of course, was President Kennedy. Just recently, we have seen uh, the election of Harold Washington, a black man, as mayor of Chicago. Does the political arena give us some indication of how prejudice is moving or perhaps not being as effective as it used to be? Yes, I think the political barometer gives us both negative and positive ones. I think on the short haul, it always gives us some negative swings. We certainly have seen that regular, uh, recently in the Chicago campaign. It surfaces all of the virulence that's still there. But as indeed uh, the um, campaign of John Kennedy began to resurface some of the virulence that had been there so deeply at the time of Al Smith. But it is the longer line that really tells the tale. And the fact is that at the present time, we have all over this country a, gr a significant number of respected black mayors. Um, we, um, we have had our first uh, uh, Catholic president. Um, and that is the longer kind of established movement. Um, you, when things are getting better, everybody puts a very fine microscope and a very uh, sharp light uh, of scrutiny on things. We've been through a time in the last couple of decades of single interest politics. We focus on everything, on each thing, and that was in itself good, but it's not good enough. Unless those cameras out there are able to pan back uh, from me to you, and sometimes on both of us, they don't let the viewer see the whole picture. I see the National Conference much like these cameras. They are the cameras, the, we are the camera that is able to help people zoom in and to see finely and deeply and clearly a single position, but then to pan out and let them see that position with a con within the context of many other positions. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because we certainly should give some, some time to the organization. Uh, how, when you pan back, when you pull back and let people see these relationships, what kinds of programs do you engage in so that they are able to see the, the, the futileness, the futility of, of prejudice? Well, one of the longest lines of success of the National Conference over its more than 50 years has been in the education of the young. Uh, we have been extremely su uh, successful uh, by other people's judgment as well as our own in uh, training counselors and teachers uh, for the schools in dealing with multi-ethnic multi and multi-racial uh, and multicultural groups. Uh, that we will always sustain. Uh, we were the first group uh, to bring together uh, the clergy dialogues uh, in many cities around this country in our own kind of circuit rides. Uh, the National Conference was, in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement, one of the chief protagonists to give a voice to the then emerging black groups. Um, that's the only place we lobby. We lobby for a voice for the voiceless, but we do not lobby for a particular voice. It's a very different position. Uh, at the present time, we're, we're moving on what we see as some cutting edge uh, programs out there to um, uh, face the yet unmet needs of today. And what are some of those? Well, we, uh, we are made, taking the first careful, not cautious, but careful steps toward a deliberate trialogue. Uh, that would broaden the base of the Christian-Jewish uh, dialogue uh, to include Muslims. Mm. Um, we are the National Conference of Christians and Jews. We will not be naively arrogant enough to think that we can play a significant, can or should play a significant role in settling the Middle East. But we cannot avoid the impact of those real events, uh, be they the consequences of the uh, war in Lebanon or the consequences of the popes having received Arafat, we cannot ignore those kinds of impacts upon the tensions in the original groups. And we believe that in being loyal to the spirit of those courageous founders in 1928, that we must be as radically inclusive of all religions in our time as they were radically inclusive to bring Jews and Christians and even Catholics and Protestants together in 1928, 29, and 30. What is the basic cause of prejudice? Is it that we just don't understand? We have imperfect information about the other people? That 
uh, I think like us? that's clearly one reason. Uh, it, it's, it's simply the state of not having the information. But I think it's deeper than that. Uh, I think that uh, my earlier comment about being so fearful that one's dignity is ass assaulted if you entertain some of the worth of the other, uh, that, we, one's, that one's uh, commitment will be somehow or other uh, impacted and uh, troubled if you open your sights is the deepest one. Uh, there are people, very good religious theologians in this country, who utterly believe uh, that religion and openness are contradictions in terms, uh, that if you ever let the faithful open their view to the insights uh, of others, that you will contaminate the original faith. I've never believed that. Uh, I believe very strongly, uh, as a committed Catholic, Roman Catholic, uh, I believe very strongly that that faith and agnosticism are kind of fraternal twins. Uh, that the man of, or woman of faith says, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, but like John of the Cross, oh God, help my unbelief. And the agnostic says, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe, but I wonder. Uh, the well, dogmatists a, are the other fraternal twins. It, it strikes me, Mrs. Wexler, that they've picked a perfect person to be the president, the new president of the council. No, the conference. there is no perfection. Uh, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a question of them. Now, this has to do with opinion. <laughs> I have a prejudice, and I think you're terrific, and I'm very glad you came to the First Estate and talked to us about prejudice and, and what you're doing to help combat it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Franciscan Sisters of the Poor are 125 years old here in America, helping to celebrate our Sister Marilyn Fisher, President of the Franciscan Sisters of the Poor, and Sister Margaret Ferry, a member of the Governing Board. How does it feel to be 125 years old? That's not a <laughs> proper question to ask two fine ladies, is it? <laughs> well, it must feel good, huh? It feels good. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that uh, you've been around so long doing all your good works. How did you get started? 125 years ago this year, five sisters came from Aachen, Germany, and they began to care for the sick and the poor here in these United States, and that's our beginning here in this country. We were actually founded as a congregation about 12, 12 years prior to that date when Mother Frances Shavir founded the congregation in Aachen, Germany, and there began to care for the sick and the poor. I think we have a picture of, of Mother Shavir. I, I wonder, I, I realize that, uh, you know, age takes a toll on some of these pictures, yes. but this is a, a, is this a photograph of her? Yes, that is. Mm -hmm. and, and the point is that you are members of the Franciscan Order, which uh, has just passed a very important date. The 800th anniversary of the death of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, you're your founder said something, there's a wonderful quotation about the healing the wounds of Christ. Could you, could you tell me how that, that got started, what she said about that? Uh, yes, when Mother Frances began to care for the sick and the poor, she felt that she was called to actually heal the wounds of Christ. And what we call the healing ministry is very much a part of the works in the apostolate that we carry out today. You primarily are involved, Sister Ferry, in, in, mm -hmm. in working with people who are sick and ill and downtrodden, is that right? That's right. That's correct. And you're That's all over the world, aren't you? In various in countries of the various world. various parts of the world, not in all parts. Well, we have some pictures here that we want to look at and right. that you brought along. And let's, let's do that now so that we can have a chance. This, of course, is, is uh, St. Francis. Saint Francis. Yes. yes. And yeah. that's on uh, the outside building of one of the institutions here in the United States. All mm -hmm. right. And then next we have, I believe, it's a group of, well, there are some of you, the, the, the governing board. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's the five-member five -member leadership board. We reside in Brooklyn. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And next is one of your hospitals. That I believe is St. Mary Saint Hospital in, in Hoboken. Hoboken, New Jersey. That uh, hospital itself is 120 years old this year. It's actually our mm -hmm. oldest hospital. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And here we have another hospital. Yeah, that's Francis Chevier Hospital that cares for the age. And, and that's in uh, Riverdale. That's in yes, Riverdale, in Bronx. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And here, our community health center? That's, uh, yes, St. Michael, I mean, not St. Michael, St. Francis, Saint Francis in, Jersey in Jersey City. City. Uh -huh. And uh, that's uh, one of the sisters taking care of a child in pediatric ward. Now, this, I believe, is one of your establishments in Brazil. That's right. That's a little maternity hospital that we have in Piris de Rio in Brazil. And I love this next picture. Now, sister, <laughs> what are you doing with that parrot? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I was trying to get used to him. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, didn't look as if you were too happy with him on your arm. No, there. I was just trying to make friends. <laughs> and that's in Brazil, too, I take it. Yes, yes, that's in Brazil. But you get around, sister. Now, here you are in Senegal. What are you doing there? Well, I went down there. Uh, sister Marilyn was also there to see how the mission was being carried out there. Uh-huh. And uh, so they had so many patients waiting at the clinic that I pitched in to help because I am a nurse oh, also. That's terrific. And then mm -hmm. finally, I think we have a picture of some sisters you know, before a portrait of your foundress. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many sisters are there in your order? We have 322, and that includes the United States, Brazil, Senegal, Africa, and then we also have sisters in Italy. What kinds of new types of health care do you envision happening in connection with your work in your many hospitals around the country and the world? We look very much at preventive health care. Rather than caring for the person once they are sick, we look for ways that we can prevent sickness and really teach and promote good health habits. So does that mean that you're interested in things like uh, uh, hygiene and, and, and teaching good health yes. habits so that yes. people won't get sick? That's right. How successful yes. have you been in that? I think uh, rather successful. Many of our, we have 14 institutions at this time, and many of those institutions are promoting various educational programs, both within the institution and for uh, those in the civic community surrounding them to promote such programs. We also, of course, have specialties in many of the institutions, and we can also have the, the health programs related to those specialties. You know, we know that the, the Roman Catholic Church is in a constant state of flux and change, and one of the issues that has come up considerably is the question of women's ordination. Is yes. there any agitation in your community about that? Yes, that certainly is discussed. Mm -hmm. um, Would you like to see it happen? I believe that we have to stay open to that. There is a need for... Uh, more priest ordained ministry and I think we have to look that everyone can maintain the fullness of the ministry and ordination and I do believe that we have to be open to that topic. Now I know that this is one that you don't like to have me ask you but it's uh, you people so forward-looking and so yes. progressive. Yes. Uh, how do you how do you explain to people your position regarding the wearing of the habit as opposed to street dress when you know that the Holy Father has urged all religious to wear habit? Uh, that is a, a question that is addressed in each congregation. We are asked to wear a simple habit, and I think we have to say that the term habit can be defined in many ways. In our congregation, we do say that we wear a simple style of dress and that we live in a simple way, and I believe that that can respond to the question of habit. It's a question of interpretation. That's right. And, and of course, the habits were street dress of a time gone That's by. That's right, that very right? much so. another so. way to look yes. at that, I suppose. Uh, you know, one of the problems that all communities are being faced with is dwindling membership. How are you working to solve that problem? We have a program that we refer to as the co-members, where people can, be, can join us uh, not in a permanent commitment to the congregation, but they are involved with us in carrying out our philosophy, in carrying out the works that we do, and this can help to, to carry out our philosophy and what it is that we were called to do. We also uh, continue to recruit for our vocations in Italy. We have our largest number of new members. We have actually more members that are not finally professed, and we have final professed sisters there. You know, um, i got a lot more questions to ask you, but I'm afraid our time is up. But uh, you have brought along uh, a friend, a, a, That's right. a sister, yes. Sister Kunigundi. Yes. And I wonder if she'd like to come in now. Sister, come oh, in here and say, come in oh. here just for a minute. and let me. She tells me, you turn around here so everyone oh, can see you. She, she, she tells me that she's got more years in religious life than you two put together. That's right. That's right. <laughs> How many years yes. is that? Fifty. Fifty. This year. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming in, and congratulations on 125 years. <laughs> In the States. Then in the States, I understand. Russell Barber for the First Estate. See you next week. <laughs>
summer camp looks like fun, doesn't it? Well, for poor folks in the city, it's more than fun. It's a downright necessity. Getting away from the heat, the noise, the crowds, even for a short summer escape, can mean the difference between people turning to street life or getting themselves restored to face city slum life. Healthy outdoor sports, enjoyment without fear, learning job and social skills, that's what the camping offers. The New York Mission Society needs your support to make these vacations possible. Writer call. It was the hardest day of my life. I'd have to leave college, not because of my grades, because of money. I'd never be a doctor. When bright young minds can't afford college, America pays the price. But the United Negro College Fund works to keep college affordable at 42 predominantly black colleges. Thanks to the United Negro College Fund, today I'm Dr. Linda Doty White. Support the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Do you suspect your landlord is overcharging you on your rent? Do you want to sublet your apartment? Does your landlord pay you interest on your rent security deposit? I'm Robert Abrams, New York State Attorney General. Tenants have important legal rights, and my office has published a booklet to explain the laws that tenants need to know. If you'd like a free copy of the Tenants' Rights Handbook, write to me at the State Capitol, Albany, New York, 12224. Visit the beautiful Brooklyn Botanic Garden. This is a Channel 4 editorial. Sometimes it's a healthy thing just to publicly debate a policy which has simply been accepted without question for a long time. We're suggesting that the matter of cultural relations with the Soviet Union should be the subject of such a debate. The questions that might be asked are, what are such relations supposed to accomplish? Are the goals achieved in whole or in part? Is what we get out of it worthwhile? So far as we can gather, the idea of creating such relationships, of exchanging artists and dance companies and exhibitions and athletes, was at least on our side based on the hope that something could be done to soften the harsh views of the Soviet government by reaching its people. What the Soviets hope to gain is less clear, perhaps the respect of other powers, perhaps something as mundane as foreign exchange, which they're always seeking. What is clear is that while we have gained by seeing and hearing some great artists, we've accomplished nothing so far as changing the stark rigidity of the Soviet government is concerned. So is a continuation of the policy of cultural exchanges worthwhile? To repeat, it is, we think, a subject worthy of debate. I'm Joe Michaels. This has been a Channel 4 editorial. Dad, I'm not a prostitute anymore. They're helping me. Will you take me back? Every day, Father Ritter's Covenant House saves runaways. They make me feel like I'm somebody. Mom, I'm not garbage. Covenant House saves them from the pimps and the predators. Daddy, I want to see you again. Just don't beat me anymore. We save all kinds of kids from destroying themselves. Please help. My life isn't over at 16. Did you know that if you're turned down for credit, for a loan, mortgage, or credit card, that you must be given a reason in writing? And if the lender relied on a credit report to make that decision, you have a legal right to see that report? You can also challenge and correct any mistakes. I'm Attorney General Robert Abrams. If you believe that you've been unfairly denied credit or want more information, write to me at the State Capitol, Albany, New York, 12224. Well, hello, ladies. I'm Nell Carter, talking to you about breast cancer, how to detect it early and protect yourself. Now, breast examination only takes one half an hour once a year, and you can get it at the Breast Examination Center of Harlem. The truth is, early detection is the only protection we have. So if you don't have your breast examined, honey, maybe you should have your head examined. Call 864-0600. Visit the Guggenheim Museum, 1071 Fifth Avenue. Here's a late report of news, sports, and weather from News 4. Hopes are running high that as of midnight Sunday, the guns finally fell silent in Lebanon. That's the word from Lebanese Prime Minister Chefik Wazan. After a long day of talks, failed to bring a truce earlier in the day. Word of the ceasefire came during Muslim shelling of the Lebanese army. Christian positions, and the U.S. Marine base. At least three Marines were wounded in Sunday's bombardment. 
President Reagan and other world leaders are gathered in New York at this time, preparing for Monday's opening of the uh, UN General Assembly. Mr. Reagan will deliver the first address of the session. The president uh, called Lebanon's President Jamal to congratulate him on the ceasefire. But Mr. Reagan said he is keeping his fingers crossed that the ceasefire will take effect. Development of the controversial nuclear missile system, the MX, will drain New York City of more than $900 million in tax revenues. The study by a Michigan consulting firm said that $27.5 billion projected for development and procurement costs would cost the average American family over $400. It would also cost a net loss of 385,000 jobs nationwide. A union representing 4,000 butchers has called a strike at some 750 metropolitan area supermarkets. The strike beginning at 9 this morning is the first walkout in the union's 30-year history. A spokeswoman said the strike would be staged at staggered markets, but she declined to say which stores would be hit first. Lay teachers at 11 Roman Catholic high schools have accepted a new contract, ending an eight-day-old strike that forced some school closings. The new pact calls for a $1,000 raise. NBC came off with flying colors at the Emmy Awards in Hollywood Sunday. Winners included uh, Special Bulletin, an Emmy for the Best Drama Special, Cheers, Best Comedy Series, Tommy Lee Jones, Best Actor for his role in the Executioner's Song on NBC, Judd Hirsch for Leading Actor in NBC's Taxi, which was canceled last season. On the local scoreboard, the New York Jets 27, the Rams 24, the Yankees 6, the Indians 4, Chicago Cubs 11, the Mets 7. The forecast, clear and cool in Midtown, overnight lows in the mid-50s, Monday partly sunny with a high near 70. This has been a late report of news, sports and weather from News 4. <laughs> There is a story about the great Rabbi Chaim of Brisk, who once began his sermon with the words, Today Chaim speaks to Chaim. He was about to admonish his congregation, and he wanted them to know that he included himself in his exhortation. Nobody remembers the sermon, but his opening is a sermon in itself. We need to listen to ourselves. If we would only listen to ourselves more often, we might not say half the things we say. If we would only realize what we are about to do, we might not do so many of the things that cause us remorse. Look around you. Better yet, think of yourself. How often do you fail to communicate with yourself? It is as if you're angry with yourself, not on speaking terms with a part of you. No, you're not schizophrenic not mentally ill, like so many people, sometimes you don't practice what you preach. That means you aren't communicating with yourself. And if you don't communicate with yourself, how can you possibly send out the right signals to others? Unfortunately, we have too few opportunities to listen to ourselves. The world around us is filled with sound and we listen more attentively to the sound around us than to ourselves. Never mind that much of what we hear is really noise pollution. The world around us is filled with advertising slogans that clamor for our attention so that we cannot hear ourselves. But when we do listen to ourselves, we're often surprised. It's like listening to a recording of one's voice for the first time. It isn't at all like one imagines but it is one's real, vo real voice. We need to listen to ourselves to know what we are really like. The Executive Volunteer Corps is a free city service dealing with all aspects of running a business. We'll discuss your money problems, and if you qualify, we can refer you to a bank where you discuss your financial needs, maybe even get a loan. We are retired businessmen and women ourselves. We understand your problems, and we want to help. Come to 41 East 42nd Street. Today, John Oliver did something that will change his entire life. He ran a red light. If he had made it, he'd have saved 30, maybe 40 seconds. But he didn't make it. 
An eight-year-old girl was crossing the street, and John Oliver hit her. Please, don't run a red light just to save a few seconds. As John Oliver can tell you, you have so little to gain and so much to lose. People who run red lights must be stopped. Summer camp looks like fun, doesn't it? Well, for poor folks in the city, it's more than fun. It's a downright necessity. Getting away from the heat, the noise, the crowds, even for a short summer escape, can mean the difference between people turning to street life or getting themselves restored to face city slum life. Healthy outdoor sports, enjoyment without fear, learning job and social skills, that's what the camping offers. The New York Mission Society needs your support to make these vacations possible. Write or call. This is Channel 4, WNBC-TV in New York. This concludes our program schedule for the day. Portions of the preceding broadcast day were pre-recorded. For the best in television entertainment, stay with WNBC-TV, Channel 4 in New York. We'll return to the air tomorrow with more of your favorite programs. This is Wayne Howell wishing you a good night on behalf of Channel 4. And now our national anthem.